shares that with us. And thank you for the technology that um, finally worked and brings us together. And we just lift up this time together um, in your holy name as we gather. And we praise you and thank you for being with us. In Jesus' holy name, amen. Amen. Let me pop this up here. Hopefully this will come off without an issue. Okay. Can you guys see this? Did I lose you? Uh, do you have, a, I don't, I don't see anything. Is there a, a, did you share a screen? Oh, let me, um, no, maybe I need to do that first. I'm really sorry. Um, hang on a minute. Duh. There is a newbie mistake. Okay, so I want to go to, no, I want to, I think I want to do this one. I had to decide which one. Sorry about that. And hopefully. Well, it's starting, it's preparing to come through. There it is. There it is. Well, I've got this dinosaur computer and I love it, but I probably should let go of it. Um, and so you can see this. Yeah, we got you. Okay, there I got you. I'd like to have you, and I don't know where y'all went, but I guess I'm, I'm just going to go through it like I did last time. So um, I just want to make sure that you guys understand. I know I talked about my degree last week, for those of you who heard it, and I, and you know, master's in food science and human nutrition, and you know, I did some competitive running, but all of this knowledge has been basically through grunting it out. I, I just listened to that prayer and I listened to the reading and it's not because I have some extra, you know, ability intellectually at all. This is basically that um, age has brought me to this point and it's, you, you make a choice, you make a choice to deal with the discipline that you're, you're asked to choose or you choose another path. And so I'm just in with the crowd. Um, I'm feeling my way through this and trying to find credible sources. And, you know, with a graduate degree, it kind of helps in that area, but still it's been because I've been in denial for a long time. So I don't have any like um, advanced knowledge or, you know, um, ability to process this any, then, any other thing that I wanted to find an answer other than going to a doctor and, and getting medicine for things that were bugging me, like old injuries or things like that. So I just wanna kinda, maybe that's a disclosure, I don't know, but making sure that um, I'm just trying to show, what, what what's a phrase that one beggar is showing another beggar where to find bread? That's pretty much what I'm doing here. And I, I just hope it um, is received and then in that way, and that anybody feels like they wanna talk to me or email me or ask me questions it's going to be received in that manner because that's how I, I like addressing this. So I wanted to start with this slide because I kind of had to finish up to, to really make this kind of knit together. And I think I can get it done in like 20 minutes. We'll see how that goes. So you guys have time for questions. But this is an issue you hear over and over again. And it does have to do with the disease mechanism of our dietary habits. So it's my genes. It's, it, it's my genetics. It's, that's the issue. It's not a complete fabrication to say that, but the problem is epigenetics can override your inherited genetics. And that can be in a good way or a bad way. So not getting too esoteric here, I, I promise, but when your DNA that your parents gave you are, is transcribed, read into proteins, these proteins do metabolic work. Now I won't go any more in detail than that. And the awesome thing and thing I teach in my classes is, you know, we are designed in this amazing way and that what you eat, the decisions you make. And I, I look at this as discipline because every day I want to eat what I want to eat. And I have to make a conscious decision to not eat that. It doesn't make magically that all the sugar cravings go away. They're always there. It's, it's just easier if you keep um, not allowing yourself to have them. So if you start eating, these whole food plant-based molecules, then these molecules feed your microbiome. And then the microbiome will make these molecules that start doing these amazing changes in your cells. 
So in this regard, you can completely reverse diseases. And there's some tug and war in Western medicine right now. Well, what can you do? What can't you do? What are the limitations? And, you know, and I'll try to handle what I can in the Q&A on that. Though a lot of these chronic illnesses, the CDC even says that of the, the what is it, 70 to 75% of Americans are on one prescription drug and 85% of those people, it's reversible. I mean, that should wake you up. So if they're saying that, then where are we with this? So you, the, what you're eating can actually turn on good genes and turn off bad genes. Problematically, the opposite can happen. And that's why a junk food diet can hurt you. And the real problematic issue is that it doesn't happen immediately. And it becomes that proverbial frog in the hot water. Oh, I get away with that. Trust me, you never get away with anything. It's gonna come down the line but um, you can reverse things even in your 70s. So, hey, there's hope for me. So this is one, um, this is a phrase, I even talked to James about it just a little bit ago. Have you heard of this? And nutrition transition is as we go through these growth spurts in human culture, you know, as we go from an agrarian, let's just say, to an industrial society, a lot of things change whether antibiotics are introduced or these, you know, the lack of uh, dangerous work is introduced, you know, our statistics change. But what they're talking about right now, and you can see this is in Lancet, it's one of the top medical journals. These are our harrowing um, predictions by 2030. And this is why a lot of um, financial institutions are getting involved in this. I used to think, why are they talking about obesity? And it's not just body image, that's not what I'm getting at. Um, talking about the chronic illness and the cost of that illness. That's what they're looking at. But this is a pretty scary statistic. And like I said, in that PowerPoint, all these go to the papers if you're interested in reading about this. Um, but it's a pretty harrowing statistic and something that kind of like, you know, is this real? Is this really happening? Because we're busy in our jobs. But when um, New England Journal of Medicine, NEJM and Lancet are talking about this, it's something to kind of prick your ears about and pay attention. So we're in a serious transition now. So what I did was I took all the statistics because we're, you know, want to get through this and get to, um, we kind of got behind a little bit and just kind of put them in a summary slide. So these are um, American statistics. This is only US. So right now, 74%, which to me, I was floored by that. Some of my colleagues I showed these slides to today, well, today and last week, and they just stared at me like, this has to be wrong. I mean, oh, this is CDC, so it's not wrong. This is legitimate. And what I got this morning even was we've moved up 26% since 2008. And that's just, that's just crazy. Like what, what, it, what is going on? Because it's, again, it's not body image, it's um, health. So TOFI, I don't know if you've heard of this. This is thin on the outside, fat on the inside. CDC also has an acronym morbidly obese normal weight, M-O-N-W. So I went and got this image for you. And I don't know if you can see what I'm seeing. This is a CAT scan. Now, mind you, the lungs are different. So you have to get a CAT scan perfect. You have to get a CAT scan exactly in the same slice of two different people and you're not gonna do this. I know this sounds kind of weird and morbid, but it's really not. It's interesting to see the inside of the body. So this one was probably just a little bit deeper on the right, but the, the telling sign is look at the fat content of the two people. Same age, same gender, same percent body fat based on our typical subcutaneous measurements. But look at the fat here in the liver on the Y on the left. This is Tophi. And the sad part, this is, a, this is what we're not talking about. So these are people that are walking around looking normal they might have a typical body fat rate, but then when you dig down deeper with an ultrasound, you find out, oh my gosh, they're 50% body fat. It, again, it's not body fat, it's not image, it's the fact that this interferes with metabolic function. And that's a real serious issue. And MET stands for metabolic syndrome. And it's a umbrella, kind of like COPD is to breathing. METS is like what is going to lead you to diabetes or hypertension or cardiovascular disease. Man, I'm doom and gloom, but I'll get through this, I promise, fast. So, and we'll get to the good stuff. 
So hypertension, high blood pressure, anything over 120. Um, I could not believe this. This is in the newest 2020-2025 dietary guidelines from the USDA, and there's a link. 45% of American adults are in hypertensive state. Seriously, that's just troubling for me. I won't go on because I probably have nothing positive to say about this, but the problem is hypertension is a gateway disease to all the other diseases. And, and a lot of people aren't told that. Here's the diabetes prevalence. So 46%, that sounds like a lot. How can that be true? Well, the majority of them are pre-diabetes. And a lot of those are undiagnosed. If you don't do a craft test, which is a glucose tolerance test, you really don't know. A uh, fasting glucose test will not even tell some doctors if a type two diabetic person is diabetic. I know. Well, then why do we still do it? I don't have any answers. I just have more questions. But um, if you don't take your fasting glucose and then what is it, 75 grams of sugar, two Cokes, that'll solve it. And then take your blood glucose 30 minutes after that. That will tell you more closely and more accurately if you're pre-diabetic or type two. Um, for those of you who aren't aware, type one is typically inherited. It's a viral component and a genetic component. So that's not what we're talking about. That's only like 3% of the population. The majority of it is all lifestyle. Um, and then this is just understanding, and this is what I can't get across to some of my students and some of them are young, so I get that. But when you have type, it, typically when you have type two diabetes, pre-diabetes or hypertension, you don't feel any pain. So you could be walking or my brother, he's 65. He is in, he's on a transplant list for kidneys, his kidneys, but he was walking around diabetic for years and didn't know it, eating his little Debbie's and drinking his Pepsi, like nothing going on. And then got upset at me for making a big deal about it. And I'm like, no, you're, you're compromising yourself. And he didn't realize because he never got tested or the test, the fasting glucose test didn't show it. So this is part of the problem is that our tests, our assays aren't really effective for showing these telltale signs that our diets are seriously affecting us. And problematically, our major organs are impacted in a short period of time. Now, some of our organs are very resilient, good news, and we can get them back, which I'm gonna talk about later. Um, so, and these are the experts I'm hearing from. And I tried to like, what can I tell people like in a nutshell, if someone's really trying to reduce their illness factors and get off their medications, this is the minimum. And you don't have to start here. You can start in small steps, but um, dietary fiber at plant fiber at 50% of what you eat every day, and then try to build up to a mile walk. And those are the typical um, guidelines that I've been seeing on the minor level. So this is a flow chart, don't get overwhelmed. Um, I, all I wanted to do was show you that there's an explanation for these statistics and why diet can lead to these diseases. You would think diet, what's a big deal? I'm just eating. But the problem is we're chronically eating and we're chronically eating the wrong things. And we're chronically in a higher state for the majority of us from what the CDC is saying of an elevated insulin level and insulin's the problem. Glucose brings on insulin. So in this top part here, you can see with the graph, it doesn't matter if your y-axis is soda with caffeine, juices or refined carbs, they're gonna spike um, your glucose and that's gonna spike insulin. In the diagram, you can see they're adding in caffeine, but it doesn't really matter because then you just drop down here to the bottom level and then you can see the liver's affected, the muscle insulin resistant, non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. I heard this mentioned about, I think it was someone in, in our congregation. I'm not really sure if I remembered that right. But um, this is actually one of the reasons why one of the main crusaders, if you will, um, started in, he's a pediatric endocrinologist at UC Berkeley. He kept finding 12 year olds needing liver transplants and he couldn't understand it. So he started going into some research on this and he even does his own research now. But this is a major issue in our country. And problematically, you don't know if you have fatty liver unless you do an ultrasound. So, you know, who's going to pay for that? And especially if your doctor doesn't warrant it or uh, suggest it. 
So a lot of these are going undiagnosed and that's one of the biggest issues. And if anybody wants to revisit the slide later, we can, because there's a lot on here, I know. So, well then, if we have all these diseased people, who's metabolically healthy? Well, this is what really woke me up. Um, between the CDC and some medical online sources, and then this is um, the Metabolic Syndrome Related Disorder Journal, they're going anywhere from 12 to 18%. But those are only the people metabolically healthy. If they had all the scans available, those are the people that would be left standing that don't have any compromised liver or pancreas because of dietary issues. It's kind of it's kind of un unbelievable, but I brought up one thing that's going to lead us into where do we go from here? So we're going to talk about good things in a second, I promise. So this is from the CDC and the U USDA. One of the uh, two of the major issues is, and I'm I'm sure you've witnessed this. Now, some of you weren't alive in the 50s. I don't want to hear about it. Well, I was kind of not alive, but um, it kind of puts you in an age range and I get it. But um, look at the serving sizes of what we consider a typical intake of a drink, a sugary drink or a meal. Um, I, I, I'm, I keep mentioning plants. I, I'm not against eating animal protein. The problem, one of the issues is that we eat a lot of it. We don't look at the serving size. And if you look at the palm of your hand, a serving size of lean meat is that it, that's it. The palm of your hand is one serving size. And you typically think of like a Big Mac or you think of sitting down to a steak and then where are you out after that? You know, there's probably two to three serving sizes there. And then look at the um, eating at home and then away from home. So you can see how, and I don't even know where we stand. I couldn't find a more updated version of this, um, but it looks like they're about to collide in 2020 by the looks of this graph. But I mean, and I know we're all, we're, we're, we're busy. We, um, it's inconvenient sometimes to have at home meals, but when you think about the convenience factor and, you know, not wanting to read a label, it, you know, that really does kind of collide to mean we don't make the best choices um, for a very a variety of reasons. Yeah, I heard this planned over is not leftovers. I loved it. I don't know why that just slapped me, but exactly. And I have to do that now because if I don't come home to something prepared, I'll just eat junk. <laughs> it's just, I'm, I'm an animal just like any other human and it's there and it's handy. And um, it kind of reminds me, if you don't have it at home, there's an inconvenience factor. So not keeping it in your cupboard is another safe bet. You might get cranky or hangry, but you're going to get through it and you'll probably make a better decision once, you know, the convenience factor isn't there. So something else to think about. Yeah, I love the CDC, the new abnormal. They, I didn't make that up. That was on that graph. So I thought that was pretty clever. So here is something I had to take pause and I'm, I'm, I'm I keep, you know, I said, you know, it's Bob's fault. I have to do this. And, but I'm really glad because some of the things I came about, you, you, you know, your whole, how you're th thinking about things and your perspective. So, you know, I read a lot about one of the, one of the tribes of the Hatsu tribe, and I don't know what country in Africa it is. I'm so sorry, but um, they go there a lot looking at their microbiome because they're very lean and between their microbiome and their uh, metabolic health, American scientists want to go over there and figure out like, what are you doing? You know, well, they're not mutants. They're not like the incredible Hulk or anything. If it, and, and the thing that kind of empowered me was if you brought those people over here, they would be ruined just like us in 30 days. You know, you, you know, we're going to talk about the bliss point. Um, and it's, it's, a, it's a trap and you're, you're hit with it every day. So these people that live in indigenous tribes that are very lean and they're gathering their food, they would eat the junk we ate if they were introduced to it. So, you know, have, you know, give yourself a break, take a deep breath. This is, we are wired for caloric density. And when we have fat, salt, and sugar, trust me, your eyes are going to dilate and your heart rate's going to go up. You're an animal, um, the, the organism, the body, and is going to respond that way because we're on a dopamine feedback loop. So we are and it's just the way things are and, you, and then you have to address it from that standpoint and this is what we have to kind of fight against so this is very very rough um flour can be anything you know you, you know corn soy and wheat 
can be ground into using, you know, different refined carbohydrates without any fiber. And then that is basically metabolically, like I said last week, the same thing as sugar. So it's going to spike your insulin and it's going to spike an inflammation response. And you're back in the same ballpark um, that you would be even if you just ate the flour and not the sugar, thinking sugar is the bad guy. It's not just the sugar. So, and by the way, I had to take a class called um, Psychosocial Aspects of Food at UF. And at the time, I was all about micro and molecular. So I was like, eh, this is lame. But I was in the devil's lair, like studying food science. How do we trick people into being addicted and hearing value-added food? And, and I ignored it for the most part. But that's coming back to me now, full circle. Like I was in those taste panels where they pull in the 18 year olds and, oh, do you like this? Oh, that's great. So we're going to market this. And, and I was in the middle of it, not really realizing what I was in the middle of, but this is a class and it's an amazing class. I have a lab component and a, a didactic component, and it teaches you a lot about statistics and why we choose the foods we choose. And they know why you choose the foods you choose. Trust me. So the bliss point is one of them. I heard this over and over again. So it's this magical phenomenon between sugar, salt, and fat where you just lose your mind. And if you don't believe me, it happened to me at a Kairos meeting. I was in charge of the cookies. And I don't know if you know anything about Kairos, but these are pre-packaged, sealed up in another package, sealed up. And I walked over to one of my friends. She's a paramedic firefighter out of Bradenton. And I said, oh my gosh, Cindy, look at my eyes. And she said, what did you do? I said, nothing. I walked by the sugar room. I walked by the cookie room. My eyes were dilated and my heart rate went up 30% just by smelling the stuff that I know I'm addicted to now. I thought it was a joke at the time, but trust me, if you've had this, you, you do get a physiological response. Um, I'll, I'll put that to the test later, maybe if we, if we can introduce it, but it's pretty crazy because you don't get the same response from, let's say, a pork chop. You don't get this response from a pile of broccoli. You're probably going to have a frowny face. But when you get your favorite sugary treat, there's a, there is a physiological response to that. And the food companies know that. So between the bliss point and marketing, you're doomed. I'm not saying give up, but just understand that you're never going to kick this. It's like, it's like a minor addiction. Not, I'm not saying I know anything about hardcore drugs in any way, but it's wired into your neurotransmitters, period. And they've shown this over and over again with PET scans. So you are dealing with a real culprit and it's not easy and you have to take baby steps. You can't just say, oh, I'm gonna go on this diet and I'm gonna win. Yeah, good luck with that. That's not gonna happen. And saying no to yourself is probably one of the first ways to fail. So um, man, I'm full of bad news today, sorry. So some tactics, this works because you have to face what you eat and you're not supposed to lie you're supposed to write down everything you eat what you, everything about it yes everything everything counts no matter if you're drinking it or eating it and at, and writing down the volume and the gram weight and maybe in a better time maybe not when you're rushed go back and revisit that at the end of the week or the end of three days but three-day journal is the minimum and it really does work because it makes you start being more accountable um fasting. So I used to do this regularly since I've only started, well, I shouldn't say only, really started eating plants, whole food plant-based. I haven't felt a need to. I don't do anything unless there's something slapping me in the face. I, again, I'm just being honest. So the reason I even started fasting was because running injuries started plaguing me. And I was hobbling around work, looking at the elevator, like kind of salivating, like I'm not getting on the elevator. I'll do whatever it takes. And fasting, this is process called autophagy. You might've heard of this. It's self-eating. Don't worry, it doesn't get gross. And it's not about weight loss. You don't fast for weight loss. You're totally doing it the wrong way. Fasting is, and I'm not talking about spiritual fast. I thought this was kind of telling when Alex mentioned it in the sermon the other week. This is about your cells cleaning up their mistakes. So, um, I put on here a series of hours because I used to measure this. <laughs> this is how crazy I am. So you will go into ketosis if you haven't eaten any calories in 24 hours and it is not fun. And you better have black coffee ready or iced tea with no sugar in it because you're going to want caffeine. And trust me, it's the fastest way to get through this. 
So ketosis, they call it the keto flu. If you're fasting, what your cells would do in this diagram. So this is one of your cells right here. So ma macroautophagy is when it's actually scrounging up. So this is, well, actually I should say this whole thing is your cell. And in, in macroautophagy, it's taking in a whole organelle in your cell and saying, you're not found worthy. I need food. I'm going to eat you. And then microautophagy is just taking in protein molecules because you're not eating. So the cells are saying, I've got to find food. I need food. And so I'm going to do this. And the good thing about autophagy is it, it's, you're cleaning up your mistakes and then your cells can clean up their mistakes. And they're actually using this in cancer treatments. They're using this in a whole host of medical treatments. This isn't willy nilly or just, you know, some religions will do it in really dedicatedly. Um, it's not like that. This is science based now to where they're looking at why have these people always been helped? We know they've been helped. They claim it. It's anecdotal. Well, why is that? And, and so I wrote down just in a nutshell, and if you want to talk more with me about this, I, I would love to, as you can tell. Um, but ketosis, 24 hours on average, it depends on your background and your metabolism. Stem cell regeneration starts at 36 and 48 is what you want to aim for. That's where you're going to get a good, that last 12 hours. You're going to get a really lot. In other words, you're making your own proteins. Like you have your own personal pharmaceutical setup in your cells saying, okay, now we cleaned up our mess. We still don't have food. Now what are we going to do? Well, they'll start upregulating these protective proteins. So you're going to start getting accidents fixed. And there's a there's so much so much on this. I won't take up any more time in this, but definitely look that up. Oshumi was the Japanese scientist that won the Nobel Prize on this in 2016. But uh, and there's a whole host of stuff on YouTube about this. But you're gonna find some wacky people, so be careful, because some of these people go seven days no food no water. Now I've done three days no food no water. I don't suggest it. I've done it. I lived, but you know probably wasn't the smartest thing. Um, your kidneys kind of need a break. And at my age, I probably shouldn't be doing anything like that, but you know, go big or go home. So are we addicted? Well, like I told you about the Kairos situation, it, they know from PET scans, we know now from psychological papers that our heart rates will go up, our eyes will dilate. And your eyes don't dilate for nothing. It's because you're focused, you want that thing. So, you know, if you're bored one night and you have your resting heart rate, get your favorite treat that has a wrapper and don't eat it, just rattle it, just touch it, just maybe smell it and watch your eyes <laughs> because it, it happens in a lot of people and your, your beats per minute, your heart rate will go up. Um, if you know your resting heart rate and then take it once you do this, you'll find out this is, not, this is legitimate and then try it with a baked potato. Wah, 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 it won't happen. It just doesn't. Another uh, story I heard from a, a, a really a person I follow a lot, a credible person said, think about it. When you go to work and someone brings in donuts or cake or something yummy and they put them on a come and get it kind of table, you're going to go get one and eat it. But if someone comes in and brings this delicious pile of kale soup and has it delved out in these sealed containers, you know it's safe. You don't eat it because you're not hungry. You put it in the refrigerator and you say, what? I'll eat it when I'm hungry because that's what you do. But there's something about sweets that overrides any common sense that we can even muster up. Let's just all admit it all at one time. Yes, I've done this. And we know we do it. And I just thought that was really helpful because everybody can, almost everybody can relate to that. Unless you are like observing fires in Oregon in a fire tower by yourself for 10 weeks at a time, but I don't think anybody's doing that. So, um, and satiety and SAD. So, I don't know if you've heard of this acronym, it's the standard American diet, and it's why we have those statistics. So, why don't we stop eating? Is it our fault? Is it something else going on altogether? Part of it is hormonal. So, these two, I love how they have them flipped. I don't know why, but I use other people's diagrams so I can't complain and I can't draw. So um, ghrelin, just think growling, ghrelin, growling. Your stomach growls, that's ghrelin. That's a hormone that says eat. Leptin is the one that shuts it down. Leptin is the one that um, leads to you feeling full. 
And if we're just eating refined carbs with no fiber and sugars, whether we know it or not, it's irrelevant, sorry, um, that spikes insulin. And insulin is a hormone. I know some people think, well, it's about glucose. No, it's still a hormone. And that's why women are sometimes more affected with serious issues like polycystic ovary disease if they're eating junk food because it directly affects that. I'm seeing that with some of my young female students. It's um, pretty scary, the rate of that disease now. So insulin can inhibit leptin. That's what, I'm, I don't know if you've ever done this. I'm just going to be open. I eat sitting there eating a family pack of Twizzlers when I was 20. I know I did it. And you could eat the whole thing and you weren't even partially sated. You're like, well, what's next? And so why didn't that pound of food sate me, satiate me? And because when insulin spiked, that all bets are off, and especially when it's super spiked. Now, um, proteins will stimulate insulin, but it's not a spike. It's just a normal release of insulin because without insulin, you can't feed your cells. So that's normal. So anyway, that's one of the issues why you keep eating the junk and you don't feel full. So here we are into our suggestions. So you wanna aim for nutrients and not calories. And here's another, so I had one of these images on the last week, but you look at these high calorie snacks. I don't know if these are Doritos or Wheat Thins. I can't even tell. I can't eat that stuff anymore, I'm too old. Then you get your Fig Newtons, your refined yummy bread that I haven't eaten in years. God. And then cookies, are you kidding me? Forget about it. So you want to shift to the more fibrous foods. And the good news is you will start to crave these things, but it's just better to start now. Um, I don't know why, like I see these diagrams, I can't complain, but you see the, um, you see the fresh fruit, which is a peach, and then you see fig Newtons. Why didn't they put a fig? People not eat figs. And why carrots and Doritos? That's got nothing to do with it. But you, you get the gist of the diagram. Um, and I'm going to bring this up again. Here's another diagram of, yeah, a more, I don't even know where Tivana is. I don't think we have one in Gainesville. But, um, and then you have the whole bunch of food on the right. And these are the same calories. So you can see where the volume, you start, you start tricking that satiation mechanism in the brain. But even more importantly than stopping eating is the nutrient density and um, the uh, diversity, genetic diversity you're getting. Because the more plant genetic diversity you're getting, the more healthier your gut microbiome. So you want to focus on what you can do. If you keep telling, I've, I've been through this. If you focus on no, you're going to get mad and you're going to just give up. I've done it. Like, I'm just going to go binge and that doesn't work out well because now I get food hangovers instead of alcohol hangovers. That's pleasant. Just telling you what you have to look forward to. So if you eat more fiber, as you can see on the right, you're gonna get more volume and it's just gonna be less of an argument. Um, you don't wanna drink your calories. What I had to do, like when I had to like cut down my drinking, I didn't even know I was drinking a lot. Um, I got my own CO2 tank from a welding supply and I make my own carbonated water. So you can do that more um, socially acceptable. They have these things you can buy, but then you're sucked into the proprietary CO2 cartridges and it's just a mess. Again, if you want to look at my system, let me know. I'll bring it to church. Um, it's kind of big, but I'll do it. Um, so making wiser choices, again, not looking at what you can't have. So diets are off. You can't, you got to stop it. You just got to stop saying I'm on a diet. Diet literally means to eat. So yes, yeah, so of course you diet because you eat unless you're fasting and let me know and I'll join in with you. But um, you don't want to call it a diet. You just want to start making small changes. So like I'm not going to drink any calories this week. Everything I drink is going to have zero calories. Just one small thing and you'll start stumbling into these health benefits and then that will lure you into doing more things. But not just going whole hog. It's not the way to go you are making an opportunity cost. And so when you give up the hamburger, the what, whatever your food is, the, you, you're paying a price, but you, you've got to know on the, the long end, you're going to get serotonin, which is the long-term delaying gratification neurotransmitter, and you're going to get a payment for it. So it's going to pay off. Um, 
yeah, we talked about labels. If you don't look at the label, you're just gonna pretend it doesn't exist. And we mentioned that too. So, and then we have a CSA in town and for the love of me, I'm someone can type it in the chat, I forget the name, but you can order your greens and fresh produce ahead of time. And if you're not going to grow it yourself to start, that's that's a good place to start is lo um, supporting the local growers. Absolutely. So this is a diagram that might help you. I'm trying to do the visual. The visuals usually sink in, not the words, not the blabbing. So look at these five dietary intakes and look at the volume you get. So you have this PowerPoint. There's a link for it. You can kind of uh, go back to it. But you can clearly see the more fruits and veggies you eat, you're just going to be... I ate so much food the other day, I couldn't, I was in pain. <laughs> it's like, I can't believe this. And I'm, you know, you're going to have to tweak your diet to make it work out. But um, when you're doing fruits and veggies only, and you want to do one day or two days a week like that, you're going to feel so full, you're going to be borderline uncomfortable and think, how can I get away with this? But if it's fruits and veggies with no calorie dressing, you can. So this is what you see when you walk into the grocery store. And this is why you have to be prepared. This is complete BS. Um, if they have to put it on the label, seriously, they are kind of covering up for something. And you probably would get something way better off if you grew it yourself or went to your local farmer's market, just saying. But don't fall into this. It's, it's not true. Just go back to the label and look at the ratios, the five to one ratio. It'd be a good place to start. This is something you can work through with your kids. They do this in some schools. It's called the Go Slow Woe program. So if you look on the left, you see the carrot, the beef, like a muscle, like a steak, or a banana, like the whole um, fruit or vegetable or meat. And then the goal is you want to eat as much as you want, go as much as you want on the left, and then you can come up with a food product under the slow and woe. Like the carrot for go, the, the woe would be carrot cake, right, with icing. You see that? Um, beef, like eating a steak, not bad if you eat the right serving size, but the woe might be ground up with covered in cheese sauce. You know, I don't know. And then the banana, you go from banana to banana cake. And you can kind of get that situation. Working through that with, with your kids of understanding like, yeah, this food is good, but if you start processing it, then you're starting to add all these value added foods that make the food companies money, but cost you your health. And so you're going from nutrient dense to calorie dense, and that's not the spectrum you want to be moving towards. So I have, I consolidated the microbiome to one slide. We talked about this briefly, but you have your dissolution, which is digestion at the top, you absorb in your small intestine, and the large intestine is where you're going to get the molecules you need, not because of only the food you eat, but because of the microbiome you keep and the diversity. So I've heard a little bit about prebiotics, probiotics, and fermented foods from people. What, what's the deal there? Prebiotics are what you feed the probiotics, which are the microbes, and then they make the molecules that keep you healthy. And the more diverse these are, the healthier you are. That's what the science is showing. Um, fermented foods are one way to get both of these. So I made my own sauerkraut and I lived. I'm here. It was actually pretty good. And what I would do is just mix it with other things like a plain baked potato. And I was like, wow, it made the baked potato taste good. I have German heritage and, you know, they, they did a lot of this stuff and I didn't like it. And I cried as a kid and I'm so sorry now, but too late for that. But you can do kimchi. I'm not brave enough for that. And you can ferment soy to make miso. That takes six months, not patient enough. So I buy it in four pound bags from Japan, sorry. Um, but I add it to different foods. It's so good. It has B vitamins and all these probiotics. Um, you have to be careful though. When you make your own fermented foods or buy them, you can't microwave them or cook them. You, you, you're Because you'd be killing the, the actual microbes and that would be detrimental to what you're trying to achieve. But if you go and buy those expensive probiotic drinks and yogurts and then don't eat fiber, you're, you're just wasting your money. So anyway, this is a really quick look at your gut going from fiber rich, what it would look like if you ate a good fibrous diet, slowly deficient, moving to the right. And then you see colitis. Colitis 
I was talking to someone at church, but it's like eating fiberglass. I'm like, wow, that sounds very uncomfortable. I don't want to do that. And the problem is when you get to where the mucus uh, lining in your gut is so worn down from the sugar and the lack of the healthy microbiome, then you get the leaky gut. And that's when pathogenic bacteria get out into your peritoneal cavity, which is basically your abdomen. And then you start getting inflammation markers because your immune system is set on high. So you got two inflammation issues going on. You got high starch, high sugar, no fiber. And then you have the leaky gut, which is actually a real thing that happens in your large intestine. So those are real things they are not made up. This is just an experiment done. Um, I think it was at Yale and they take mice, they, they wipe out their microbiome, they introduce human gut microbiota, and then they starve them of fiber. Isn't that great what we do to animals in lab? And then they're just showing you in these simplistic diagrams that after you do this, the actual protective layer of the large intestine is gone. And that's when you get the weird autoimmune disorders that can be cured just from eating good fiber foods. So there's a lot being done on this by Credible Labs. So I did show this list last week. Um, the gut microbiome has been shown to do so many things. Um, and anybody wants to ask me in the Q&A about this, I'll, I'll go over it. But the FMT is fecal micro, um, microbiome transplant. So yes, they take fecal matter, they strain it. Obviously they know this person doesn't have any pathogens before they do this. They transplant it and we are talking night and day solutions to people's diseases, night and day. And so much night and day that the Mayo Clinic and Johns Hopkins is doing it. So this isn't like fly by night and someone's back, you know, shed somewhere in Florida. This is legitimate uh, medical institutions are doing this for a host of issues. So you can ask me about that later if you want to. And we get to our kids. And I don't know if you know anything about this. There's a lot in this cartoon. I thought it was very well done, but it's just sad. So they're saying, well, now we're giving them healthier choices in the schools. Yeah, but a kid has no uh, ability to have self-discipline in this area for the most part. And if mom and dad aren't looking, well, if it's there, I'm going to eat the candy. I'm going to eat whatever they're offering me, the pizza. So yeah, they do have some better choices, but I'm not going to, if I was 15, I wouldn't choose the healthy food, broccoli, whatever they're doing over the pizza. So they are offering that, but I don't know if, with, if they're offering still the junk food that that's really helping much, but that's my two cents. So these are from um, professionals with kids. So uh, one thing is teach them how to cook. I didn't really know how to cook when I left, um, but I really wasn't interested, but maybe they don't get a choice and they have to learn how to cook and then they have to cook for the meals. I don't know. That's probably why I don't have kids, but they would just not like me. So um, maybe then once they're buying produce with you, if you're in a farmer's market, you're in the produce department, hey, you know, I'm paying $5 a pound for this. If you grow it, I'll buy it from you. That was another thing suggested. And I thought that might be kind of cool business skills. And then teaching them why it's important to read food labels. Um, that gets a little bit more didactic and it might not be as fun, but um, if they know what these things do to them long-term, maybe. And then another one was you're supposed to eat eight to 12 plants a day to get the diversity. I know. If I heard myself say this a year ago, I'd be laughing out loud, but here I am, um, hypocrite of the universe. So making a checklist in your refrigerator, you know, make a game for the kids, like how many do we eat today? And I don't know what age group this would work for, but this is just suggestions that were made. These are some links if you wanna click on them. They're pretty interesting videos on YouTube about what we covered here. And this is my last slide. Um, this is why we're up against a monster. Um, it makes the tobacco companies look small. And I'm not saying food companies are bad. Um, they paid for my graduate degree, but they're, you're um, going against professional marketers and you're going against people that know how to trick your nervous system into wanting more. Um, one of the um, advertisements where you can't, you can't just eat one and they're not lying. I mean, if it's in front of you before you know it, it's gone. So I'm going to just end there and um, 
hopefully I still, I don't know how much time is left. Oh, it's eight o'clock, great. Sorry guys. So I don't, um, I guess I have to click out of this so I can see you or maybe stop sharing. Yeah, there we go. So I didn't leave much time, but. Wow, that was wonderful. Well, I'm sorry, I did take longer than I thought. I, I, I really, I'm, I was able to walk through that with you. And um, so let's let's take about 10 minutes. We'll just go maybe five minutes after eight. Um, I'm willing to stay in longer for anybody that wants to. I mean, okay. but I don't, if people have to leave, I get it. Okay, that's, that's fine. So um, why don't we start with any questions um, that somebody may have? I, I know Jose had one about um, soy because um, there's a lot of diets out there. And let me just say, I'm not against diets. I am absolutely not against diets. Doing a diet for 30 days, that's why I like the whole 30 in that regard. It wakes you up and gets you real results. And it does. But it also sets a lot of restrictions that can make life unlivable. <laughs> I'm just being honest. And to give up soy, beans, and milk, like, shoot me. I, it's just horrible. So soy has been given a bad rap because of the isoflavones. And this is supposed to mimic human estrogen. And I did a lot of reading of this because Jose sent me an email and I thank him for that. Um, but if you look at the similarities, all you have to do is Google estrogen and testosterone. And the similarities between those two hormones is almost untellable by the human eye, unless you know what you're looking at. And estrogen to isoflavones is night and day. You can clearly see the, dim, the differences. And the studies that were done, rats were fed enormous amounts of soy. Like you would have to only eat soy like until you wanted to pop to get the mimicking effects of um, estrogen. So I was really glad he sent me that question because I heard that from a student earlier and I wanted to look into that and I never had. So um, soy isn't anything you want to avoid. Um, if you're eating it in a normal amount and like miso is fine, it's fermented, it's giving you probiotics and B vitamins. So I'll just start out with that. That's helpful. Thanks, Leanne. Yeah. Um, I had a question about two kinds of food. Um, one is eggs. I assume that eggs are okay because you raise chickens and eat eggs. <laughs> I, I used to eat, uh, we used to have chickens and we kicked them to the curb, sold those suckers, they weren't laying and get out of here, um, freeloaders. But yeah, I mean, come on, eggs, I mean, an egg is a picnic basket for a peep. It's going to become a chicken. I, I don't even know where this came from. I get the cholesterol. Some people, now I'm saying this from a healthy standpoint, and as the slideshow showed, 17.6 for us, six for us are healthy. If you have cholesterol levels, that are high, yes, maybe you want to look into this a little bit further, but an egg is the perfect food because it's going to become a peep. So it's a perfect balance of amino acids to cholesterol. And it's not bad for you. Now, I we raised our free range. I don't know what they're feeding the, um, the grocery store typical egg. So that's another thing you want to think about. The other thing is, um, you know, trying to get off sugar, of course, is really difficult. Yeah. What do you think about the uh, Stevia product? I think the Stevia product is good. Um, I haven't looked more into the processing of Stevia. James bought me a Stevia plant. I could not believe how sweet the leaves were. Mm. That's legitimate. That is, I don't even think they would have to do anything to that. Because when I bit into the leaf, I was floored by this. You can buy this plant. Um, so if you're going to use... We use stevia here. I don't use any other artificial sweetener other than like if you have a diet soda and you're grabbing it quick on the go, it's not good. My lymph nodes swelled up from those things once, um, but stevia as far as the sweetener is great. It's from the Thank reading you. I've done. Thanks. Yeah. I had a stevia plant for a short time, but it was hard for me to keep it alive. Yeah, we, did, we didn't keep ours alive, but we killed a lot of things. So, you know. And That's they're hard to find. Are they? Well, that this was up in Kentucky. I, it was hard, like it was hard to find one to buy. So. I don't know where James got his. 
One time, Leanne, you mentioned about cleansing, uh, cleansing kind of fast or something. Um, can you tell, tell me what that is? And yeah, and can you do it without caffeine? I don't do caffeine at all. So you're saying, you know, drink coffee the next day. Well, I don't do that, so. Oh man, that sucks because I don't know how I could do a fast without caffeine. Like I went into a physiological crisis. Um, I told Josh Pothin about it one time. He just stared at me, but my blood pressure plummeted. My insulin, I, I was drinking this silly celestial seasoning herbal tea and they're lying. They are totally lying on those labels. That is not what's in that stuff because I don't crash on the floor and break out into a cold sweat from nothing. So I was into a 48 hour fast. I was 36 hours into it. And I thought I was going to have to call an ambulance. I was about ready to hit my shin on the couch to get fight or flight adrenaline to get me going to go to work. So um, fast work. I don't, I know these cleansing fasts, they have these things they want you to drink. Um, I personally dry fast now if I do it, um, but will drink uh maybe probably two cups of black coffee over a period of two days. Without caffeine, I'm kind of feeling in the dark, Elena. I don't know what to tell you because caffeine is a tool and I think we misuse it. I think it's very helpful if, um, if you use it the right way. Um, and I think if someone's fasting, you kind of need something, but for someone trying to do a 48 hour fast, for instance, without any kind of caffeine, I think that's really rough. So that's just my two cents. But as far as a cleansing fast, you don't need to drink anything but water and, and black tea or black coffee. And Elena, black I've, I've done a fast without caffeine. And I mean, like Leanne's saying, I mean, you, you, do, you do feel tired. But, but, you know, I mean, again, it, everyone's going to react a little differently to it. Probably it, it, it might make it harder. But it, it, I guess it's, it, and I think Leanne would agree, it's definitely doable. It just yeah. might be a little more unpleasant than, than otherwise. Yeah, I should try it, stop being such a baby about it and just do it and see what what falls out. Um, I just had such a bad effect from this, the herbal tea. I was like, that's it, I'm done. <laughs> you're, you're fired. So Just warn James. Yeah, I will. <laughs> Maybe when he's gone, <laughs> he goes somewhere. But So the, when you say a cleansing fast, it's just simply a fast? <laughs> I mean, there's not, and like you say, there is some where people drink stuff and it's supposed to you know, clean out their system and, and whatever. So are those two different things or is it the same thing? It, it's, honestly, your cells are going to do what they're going to do. Isn't it amazing that we think we have control over all this? We think we're going to fix ourselves by what we take. What we're going to fix ourselves is by what we don't take. <laughs> I mean, the Bible's pretty clear about our mouths and how bad a situation it can get us in. And it's not just verbal, it's intake. And, and look at Western medicine and I'm not putting it down. And I feel bad for doctors because how many chronic patients do they have showing up wanting the same pills? They wanna take a pill to get better. And if we would just think, well, maybe it's what we shouldn't take in. So a cleansing fast can literally be just leaving your cells alone. Just get out of their way for 48 hours and let them fix all these mistakes that we think we are fixing because we're not really fixing anything. And then do you need to finish up, off with having, putting in some new probiotics pre, uh, and those other things at the they end? Say, they say that if you um, go without food, um, it, it does cut down and they start, um, they start like waning off. But bacteria are so resourceful. They they 48 hours isn't gonna isn't gonna do anything major. And when you look at some of the 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 toxins we take into our body from alcohol to antibiotics that and you know we really wipe our microbiome out with that stuff. Um, and then some of these drinks that we just drink and we say, oh, even though I can't pronounce the stuff on the, the label, I'm gonna take this in. Who knows what that does? So you don't really have to worry about your gut microbiota. It'll take care of itself as long as you're not going on an extended fast. So Leanne, maybe to ask that a little more broadly, how do you typically try to break a fast? What, what kind of foods do you, do you lean towards? What kind of foods do you lean away from? I am the worst person in the universe to ask that question because I break all the rules because I'm like, ah, oh, um, 
I sometimes I'll if I'm really really good, so I'll just do <laughs> my best break fast is um, carbonated water and air uh, hot air popcorn. Sorry, that's about as best as I can get because you know you got high fiber, you got some starch in there to give you some energy, and you got a lot of water to refeed, um, and that's that's been my best break because mentally if you're working really hard and you're fasting you kind of get kind of selfish <laughs> you're like I want to eat something that I want so I don't have much more than that but there's a lot of information online they say like fruits and vegetables in small amounts is the best way to do it so I probably don't do it the best way maybe one or two more questions anybody I was curious about this whole milk situation and now there are all these other so-called milks that are so heavily processed you could not pay me to buy them. I'm starting to become lactose intolerant as I get older so I get lactate milk and I get the organic stuff because USDA organic is actually a legitimate label you just have to know what it means and not take it to mean super healthy or anything like that. And I was just kind of, and now the new thing is oat milk. And it's like, really? I'll just eat my oatmeal in the morning. Why do I need oat milk? So it's just kind of yeah. curious what your take on all these other milks are. I, I don't do dairy much. And it's not because I have a problem with it. It's just like, to me, I'm not going to drink calories when I can eat calories. That's just me. Um, other than, you know, my adult beverage. But uh, so I'm not a... Uh, I don't typically do dairy, so I'm not really up on that. I don't have any input on that. Um, I can only tell you what other people have told me and that's not very helpful. So I don't really know a lot about the soy and the almond and different kind of milk products. Other than I go get um, uh, uh, unpasteurized goat milk from someone in Williston and I let it on my counter and I make it into kefir because my mother had to go get it for me one time from the Mennonites and she wasn't happy when I was in Pennsylvania. So I do do kefir from goat milk, unpasteurized goat milk for probiotics, but it's just for fun. I don't think it, um, I just do it to see what will happen. It's not because I think I need it. So I'm not much help there. I think the only the only other thing I, I remember was the inflammation questions and I tried to cover that in the presentation but that word keeps coming up in health circles um and I think I mentioned it where inflammation is exacerbated by insulin levels because of glucose and starch and then also the leaky gut because we're not taking care of what we're eating we're not getting enough fiber but the inflammation that is one of the reasons why I started fasting was inflammation and my pain went away after two 48 hour fasts with a two week interval. I was floored. Um, I did it for the wrong reasons and I went about it the wrong way, but somehow God kind of worked me through it. And I, and I, but I can completely testify that fasting is one of the, the quickest ways to get rid of that response, um, the immune response in your body. It really works. It was like a switch. But then well, Leanne, um, thank you. Well, thank you guys. I know we're way over, so I appreciate it. Oh, not, not much, you. just a little bit. And we got started late. So it we're just really was the right amount of time. Um, and everybody has your contact information and you yeah. know, I've maybe been pondering some other questions and all that'd be okay for us to just send you a email or to ask you when we see you. Oh yeah, absolutely. I think my email is in the directory and you want to pull me aside in church and because I'll share my horror stories. If you want to share yours, it's great. I, I love talking about this because it's not because I'm some expert in it. It's because I had to go about it the hard way on my knees <laughs> when you're, when you're really down and out and you got pain or you have, you're not responding the way you used to, you got to wake up to yourself. So, um, it's just better to do it through dietary changes than it is for drugs and medication. That's, that's my only hard, hard sell. <laughs> you know, the Jewish concept of the soul is that we are a soul. We don't have a soul. And so part of being your soul is your, 
your body and your spirit and your mind and your emotions and all this is is really us and so when we neglect one part of it it affects everything else and um so this is this is really encouraging uh certainly for me and i'm sure for for everybody so thanks for the time and the preparation and and like i say we're this is all recorded and uh, now I'm going to go back and, and watch and send this to some friends and all. So it really, really makes a difference. I mean, it, it has an impact and just appreciate you taking the time to do this. Um, so Father James, do you mind uh, closing us in, in prayer? And uh, thank you for letting your wife spend so much time on this stuff that she just neglected the chickens and you got rid of them. And, you know, <laughs> well, she's going to spend time on it anyway. She might as well share it with other people. Well, let's close out in prayer then. Father, thank you for this time you've given us. Thank you for the ability to come together and to learn together. We pray you'll be with us tonight. Grant us all a good day tomorrow in Jesus' name. Amen. Blessing thank you, guys. Thank you, Leanne. Thanks, Leanne. See ya. Thank you. Yeah. Yep.